Do you recognise these two great Australian heroes on the screen? Hands up if you recognise them. Oh, really, not very many. They're not sports people. Maybe that's why we don't recognise them. In Australia, we celebrate our great sports people, don't we? But uh, on the screen, you're looking at Professors Richard Scolia, AAO, Order of Australia, and Professor Georgina Long, AO. Here's why they're heroes. 15 years ago, if you were diagnosed with advanced melanoma, you had a less than 5% chance of surviving five years. That's 2009. In the 15 years since then, the survival rate for advanced melanoma is now 55%. From 5% to 55%. Imagine, thanks to the work of these two, these are the two who are responsible for that incredible improvement in melanoma treatment. Now imagine what the rate will be like in 15 years' time from now. Their goal, and they're serious about it, is to have zero deaths from melanoma in Australia. Zero deaths. That's not a pipe dream. That's what they're seriously working towards, and uh, I hope they get there. I hope they get there. I, I call these two Australia's great death defeaters. They're, they're banishing a terrible disease, putting it in its place, and offering the hope of life to people who otherwise would be faced with a death sentence. But their story took a really interesting turn in May last year because Professor Richard was diagnosed with a brain tumour. The brain tumour of a type which has a 0% chance of survival. So what they decided to do is they, they had a hunch, but Pro Professor Long had a hunch that what they were doing with melanoma could possibly work for brain tumours. So she suggested this to her colleague and he said, yes, let's do it. And so he's the first patient in the world to receive this melanoma treatment for his brain tumour. Uh, it's risky, a lot could go wrong, but they're hoping a lot might go right. And so far, he's not out of the woods yet, right? He's only, only a few months into the treatment, but so far the results are looking promising. So far. Uh, Australia's great death defeaters. What's interesting is that Richard is being very public about how it's all going. His story has been published in the media and uh, people respond. You know how they put, they put a story on a website and you can make comments on the bottom. It's interesting to read people's reactions to this story. What's, what's obvious is that for those people who are following this, we're really rooting for him. We want him to be successful. We, we said, come on, we want this treatment to work because if it works for him, it's going to work for other people and that'll be great news. If it works for him, he'll be able to continue on in his incredible groundbreaking research with other types of cancer. If it works for him, he'll be able to continue being a father and a husband. And so we're, we're rooting for him. We want it to work. But perhaps there's another reason too why we want it to work for Professor Scolia. And that is there's a feeling that perhaps he deserves it. Surely a man who has done so much to help other people deserves to be helped himself. Here's one comment from a member of the public uh, responding to uh, an article about him. My fervent wish is that Richard's treatment is successful, giving him the time with his family that his sacrifices most certainly warrant. Did you hear that? He, he deserves it. He deserve Now, to be clear, the good professor has not said anything about deserving successful treatment himself. He, he, he's not the one saying this. Uh, he wishes to be well, yes, and that, that's a, an appropriate wish. He wishes to, to leave a legacy for other people to follow, that's appropriate. He's not saying anything about being deserving. Other people are saying that, but you can understand why people say it, can't you? It's an interesting question. Who deserves to be well? Who deserves to receive the expert work of an expert death defeater? Who deserves it? If you've been at church for a while, you would know that we worship the, great, the greatest death defeater of them all. Jesus Christ killed on a Friday, raised triumphant from the grave on the Sunday. And as we've seen in our Bible reading from Luke chapter 7, it his work, defeating death, is a work that he's, he's willing to share with other people. In his own ministry, raised people from the grave, and then the promise of the Bible is that when he returns, all who have faith in him 
will be called out of the grave and will live forever. The great death defeater. And as we take a look at Luke chapter 7, the question Luke helps us answer is this. Who deserves this blessing? Who deserves it? I think the answer is not one that our world easily accepts. And perhaps it challenges our own sense of deservedness as well. Maybe. Let's have a look at the great death defeater in action. Luke chapter 7 verse 1. You'll notice the Bible passage did not appear on the screen. Sorry if that was a shock and a surprise. Um, what what we're, we're going to do from this point on is not have the Bible passage on the screen. I want to encourage people to have the Bibles open on their laps or on your phone. Um, one person from the 830 service said that given it's not going to be on the screen, she's going to start bringing her own Bible to church. We want to encourage that. Uh, Many people are familiar with their own Bible that they use. Um, you find a, a Bible under a seat near you, or you can pull it up on your phone, uh, or you can just listen. But uh, Luke chapter 7, beginning at verse 1. Who deserves this blessing? When Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. There a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, this man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. Here's the first attempt to answer our question. According to the Jewish elders, it's the centurion who deserves the gift of life because, well, he's earned it. He's earned it. It's possible that this centurion was a member of a class of person in the ancient world known as the God-fearers. He was a God-fearer, perhaps. Seems to fit that description. A God-fearer was not a Jewish person, but was someone who had come to believe in the Old Testament God. Uh, you see them pop up in the New Testament from time to time, particularly in the book of Acts. It could be that this centurion was a God-fearer. And this God-fearer was all in with his new religion. He loves our nation, they say. Now, I imagine that for a centurion who is working for the Roman state, for him to have the reputation as a lover of the Jewish nation, that could have been a little bit risky. That could have been frowned upon by his superiors. Uh, maybe interpreted as being a little, bit, a little bit treasonous to be a lover of the Jewish nation, a subjugated people. Uh, he was the emperor's man, the emperor's centurion. So it could be that he was um, willing to risk his reputation because he'd come to understand something of the God of the Bible. Uh, all in with this belief in the, in the God of the Scriptures. And not only was he willing to risk his reputation, he was willing to drop some coin on a special building project, built the local synagogue. His commitment was both ideological as well as material. All in. And so he deserves to have you do this, they say to Jesus. The Jewish elders viewed this situation through the lens of merit. If blessing was there to be had, then it should go to the person who really deserves it. It's a viewpoint that remains familiar 2,000 years later. As a society, we celebrate great achievements, don't we? Um, if you keep an eye on the newspapers and the news websites, you would. I was, I was stunned at how many articles about HSC results were published in December. Article after article after article about which were the top schools. James Roos has been knocked off their perch. There's a headline that Sydney people care about, apparently. Um, here are the, the students who, who got multiple band sixes and the students who are at the top of their subjects. It, it was a flow of articles about achievement. We teach our people from a young age, don't we, about how important it is to get results. I wouldn't be surprised, is it, or is it any wonder, that that kind of thinking leaks over into our thinking about religion, that it's about achievement. Will God have a place for me in eternal life? Will he raise me from the dead? Well, if I live a good life, if I manage to have something to show for it, then perhaps... Perhaps like these Jewish elders, we think hard work for our society is the ticket. They appreciated love for their nation. What about a devotion to our own community, 
a life of volunteering, a life where you have a career in a service industry, a life where you make a difference. Maybe our sense of community is smaller. What about a life lived in service of our family? Will God say, here's eternal life for you because you were such a great family man. You're a wonderful mother. You're an obedient child. Have eternal life. Is that the way it's going to work? Of course, the community of the Jews was also a religious community. Surely there's a path to blessing through being devoted to our own place of worship here. Uh, plenty of us here in this room have donated plenty of money over the years to our own physical structure here. Uh, these, uh, don't these chairs look smart? Uh, this is the most recent example. Uh, surely that's a path to blessing. Is that how we secure eternal life? The answer of the centurion's friends would, su would suggest yes. He deserves it because he's done so much. But that's not what the centurion himself thinks. It's interesting. Uh, from the second half of verse 6, he was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. This is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word and my servant will be healed. It's one of the great ironies of the Gospels that the people you think ought to get Jesus often don't get him. The religious leaders, the disciples, they flounder about in misunderstandings. But it's often the outsiders who get it. The centurion, you wouldn't expect him to get it. But he gets two things right here. One thing about himself and one thing about Jesus. About himself, he says, I do not consider myself worthy. He has no sense that he is somehow deserving of Christ's blessings that he's deserving of Christ's mercy, even though he is devoted and he is generous. But he doesn't see those things as currying favour with the Lord. He understands that's not how it works. I wouldn't be surprised if he'd been shaped by listening to the Old Testament and listening to verses such as this one from Isaiah, which you heard with Nick when he was preaching through Isaiah a few weeks ago. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. It's from Isaiah 53, verse 6. It's one of many places in the Bible where we understand, we come to understand that we all have a sin problem, which means none of us are worthy. In order for us to receive God's blessing on our own effort, we'd have to be perfect, but that's not the case for any of us. None of us are worthy of the blessings of the death defeater. That's actually the answer as to who is deserving. Nobody. Nobody's deserving. And the centurion knows this. He also knows that Jesus is one with authority. He also knows that Jesus is one whose words are powerful. Jesus speaks and things happen. But say the word and my servant will be healed. He sees a parallel in his professional life. Verse 8. For I myself... I'm a man under authority with soldiers under me. It's interesting that as he speaks about his professional life, he first speaks about how he is under authority. He doesn't just jump straight to, well, I'm a centurion and I have a hundred men under me. It, it's, just a little, it's just a little hint of the man's humility that, that Luke includes for us. I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. But as he's worked in the military, he's, uh, he's observed, even though he has this humble point of view, he, he's observed how power works. Uh, words of military officers are effective. I remember I was in London a few years ago and uh, around the tourist areas with where all the royal palaces are. And um, if you've ever seen a tourist get too close to a royal guard, you'll know the royal guard lets them know. And so we were milling around at the front of this palace. Uh, through the gate came a young officer on horseback. And there were tourists kind of jostling to get in the frame. And one got a little bit too close to the horse. Make way for the Queen's Guard! <laughs> and uh, I've never seen tourists move so quickly in all my life. They parted like the Red Sea. <laughs> and then the officer came through. Uh, words that have an effect, and so it is with Jesus. He speaks, things happen. 
And the centurion has confidence in this. He doesn't have confidence in himself. Doesn't have confidence that he can somehow wrangle a blessing from Jesus. Rather, he knows, well, Jesus is the one who has to give the blessing and all he can do is ask. Put his trust in Jesus. This is the response of faith that we see here rather than the response of carrying up favour through our own efforts. How does Jesus respond to this? Verse 9. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him and turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. Jesus responds by freely rendering his services as a death defeat. I mean, the servant hadn't died yet, but he was probably well on his way. And yet that that disease is banished. Uh, not even with a word from Jesus, just with a, with a decision. So here's the key as to how we access this blessing of new life. Rather than trying to earn it, we recognise our, our unworthiness, we recognise Jesus as the one with authority, and we trust that he's the one who was able to bless us with what it is that we need. Sadly, not everyone gets this. There's still a sense that perhaps they need to have their life in order, in order to receive Christ's blessing. I was over lunch recently, a friend of mine was talking about, oh, when I get to heaven, etc., etc. But But she, inter she interrupted herself with the words, well, fingers crossed. When I get to heaven, oh, fingers crossed, fingers crossed. And I, I thought, it's a sad comment, really. And I recognised it because for years I felt the same way, that somehow my own performance would let me down, that I'd get to the age to come, I'd stand before God and he said, well, you kind of got it, but you didn't quite get it, and so you're missing out. You're missing out on eternal life. That was my great fear. But it was a needless fear because eternal life is 100% a gift. In no sense is it, is it a, a merit award. In no sense. Some people think it's a little bit us, a little bit God. We, God shows us grace, but we can't come to the party. No, it's entirely God's grace. His favour on unworthy people. That's what, how grace is defined. We are completely unworthy, and yet we receive it. Others may feel unsure for good reasons, actually. Maybe they haven't trusted in Jesus, or they haven't recognised him as Lord. Um, for those people, then crossing your fingers ain't going to do a thing. You need to come to him and put your trust in him. But then this grace flows like a, a tap. It's there for us to have it. If only we recognise who Jesus is and, and put all our trust in him as the one with authority. Uh, Luke's habit is to join stories that complement each other together. They, they, he butts them up against one another and they, they interpret one another. And so from verse 11... We have another scene of the death defeater in action, but this time he blesses a very different person. The centurion was humble, but he could still be seen, I guess, as a star recruit, a man with authority, a man with a, some financial means behind him. But if you had absolutely nothing to offer, would Jesus still offer you the blessing of healing? Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a large crowd followed from the town, and a large crowd from the town was with her. In biblical times, uh, widows were basically guaranteed to be destitute. The husband was the source of financial security and uh, physical security as well. If the husband was no longer in the picture, then the son or sons were responsible. But this woman had lost both husband and son. What hope was there for her? Um, if God's blessing was best based on merit, how would this widow ever compete? She couldn't match the centurion. She didn't have that means. What, I can't imagine the Jewish elders ever saying about this widow, she has gone, done great things for our nation. Um, she, she deserves Jesus to act a miracle here. Nevertheless, even though she has nothing, the death defeater brings great blessing. Verse 13, when the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her and he said, don't cry. Then he went up and touched the bier where they were, carry they were carrying him on and the bearers stood still. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk. 
and Jesus gave him back to his mother. Just as the centurion recognised, Jesus speaks and life springs forth. So bringing these two pictures together, we get the, we get the sense, the complete sense of what, it, what is required for us to receive this blessing of life. Even though we have nothing, Christ has everything and he's willing to give it to us if we, if we trust him and recognise who he is. That's what it's all about. If we call on him for this wonderful blessing. Now our focus has been on the ones receiving the death defeater, but of course all the time the eyes in these events would have been on Jesus, everyone looking at him. Hear the reaction from verse 16. They were all filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. Let's just close by trying to recapture some of the awe that these people would have felt. As the centurion recognised, there is great power at work here. With a word, people are healed. Death is reversed. Does this power remind you of any other part of scripture? Where with a word, life springs forth? Genesis chapter 1. God speaks and life happens. No wonder these people say, God has come to help his people. This is God at work here. And compare Christ's power with the impressive power of our two professors. Let's put them back up on the screen again. Our two professors here. Now, these, I'm, I'm serious when I say that these are two of the greatest healers medicine, have, medicine has ever produced in the history of medicine. But think about how much time and research and experimentation and funding and failure has gone into their success. How much hard work it all is. And compare that with Jesus who speaks and death is reversed. I mean, it's on another level, isn't it? And not only is there great power, but great compassion as well. See this particularly with the, the, what the widow receives. His heart went out to her, don't cry, he says. And he touches the beer, risking ritual uncleanliness. It was bad news for a Jewish person to get near a dead body, made them unclean, but that didn't matter. There was a life to give back. In fact, Jesus gives back two lives, doesn't he? Not only the son, but also restores the fortunes of his mother now that she has her son back. And friends, there's hope for us too here. Christ's own resurrection is one that he will share with us. When he returns, he will speak and the dead will be raised, will come out of the grave. After, uh, this is the picture that John has in his gospel. Uh, we will respond to Christ's word and we will live again. Um. If Richard Scolia's treatment is successful, and I pray it is, really all he's doing is he's managing to put off death for another day. Uh, death will say, well, not this time, Richard, but I'll knock again. I'll come round again, as he will for all of us. And so we need the great death defeater. That's who we need. And uh, his services are there for us. We don't have to bring anything. Um, good news for people who have nothing, but we must recognise who Jesus is, that he is the Lord and the one who has this power of life in his mouth, speaks with a word, and we live. Let's trust that uh, we'll receive that. I'll lead us in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Gospel of Luke and uh, for these great stories, and we pray that we will receive that great blessing of the defeat of death when the time comes that we'll hear those words of life and uh, live forever. And we trust that Jesus is the one who can bring that for us. We recognise him as the Lord. We turn away from any sense of us being Lord of our own lives. We turn away of, from any sense of us trying to curry favour or, or wrangle a blessing through our efforts. Uh, we recognise our unworthiness due to our sin and we turn to Christ and knowing that he is rich in mercy, full of grace. And so we accept what it is that he promises, eternal life, and we can be 
sure that that's ours. We thank you for that. We do pray for the work of Professors uh, Scolia and, and Long. We thank you for the great success that they have had. Um, and we do pray that in coming years, uh, their, their research might bear more and more fruit, blessing many people. We pray for uh, Richard himself as he receives uh, experimental treatment and we do pray that it might be successful because that's going to be good news for so many people as well as him. I have no idea about the faith of those two, about what they believe in. We do pray that they will both come to know, if they haven't already, uh, the great death defeater and uh, they too might receive the, the blessings that he has to offer. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.